The Old Testament reading for today is from 2 Chronicles chapter 22, verses 8 to 9. You may follow in the Pew Bible at page 352. When Jehu was executing judgment on the house of Ahab, he met the officials of Judah and the sons of Ahaziah's brothers who attended Ahaziah, and he killed them. He searched for Ahaziah, who was captured while hiding in Samaria, and was brought to Jehu and put to death. They buried him, for they said, He is the grandson of Jehoshaphat, who sought the Lord with all his heart. And the house of Ahaziah had no one able to rule the kingdom. The epistle reading is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 to 5, in the Pew Bible at page 949. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be the holy and blameless before him in love, he destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God, and thank you, John. I didn't, um, well, actually I did. I did mean for him to read all those names. It, it's a good thing. It is. It really is. Okay, good morning again. As I mentioned, we are in actually our second week of our sermon series, which I've titled Finding Our Identity in Christ. And one of the reasons we are exploring our identity, who we are, right, is because we live in an image-conscious world, one that's saturated and we're constantly being bombarded with suggestions of who we, sh who we should be or become, okay? For example, who wants to teach us how to sing? Or who wants to teach the world to sing? Coca-Cola, right. Right? Right, right. No? Is that way before your time? This is, that was like my time when I was growing up. Okay, or, or um, well, it's no longer teach the world. To, I don't think it's even just have a Coke and a smile anymore. I don't even know what the new one is. Okay. But then what about um, my baloney has a first name. It's C-A-R, right? We, we're influenced by what the world is trying to shape us into. They are, they have an intention, they do, okay? But in a world where we're constantly being told what to buy and what to do, I am suggesting, okay, I'm just suggesting because I believe that you are all very mature adults who can make decisions for yourselves. I'm suggesting that as disciples, as apprentices of Jesus, who are supposed to make apprentices of Jesus, because that's God's will for our lives, we should find our identity not by the shoes that we wear or the toothpaste that we use, but in our relationship with Christ. Because in a world that's full of people searching for their identity and for answers to the question, who am I? We, the children of God, have an answer for them. Because Jesus is the answer. He is the way, the truth, and the life, as the Bible tells us, as he tells us. No one comes to the Father except through Him. So let's take a look at a video which summarizes what I'm talking about. Who am I? Am I what I do? An artist? An accountant? A teacher? A mother? Or am I what I've achieved? An honor student? An MVP? A winner? Am I the things I've done right? Or am I defined by the things I've done wrong? Am I a saint? A sinner? What about what others think of me? Am I all of these things? None of these things? Who am I? How I identify myself determines how I approach life. If I am what I do, I'll always need to do more and achieve more to find my value. If I am what others say, I'll always try to please people instead of my Heavenly Father. But if I listen to who God says I am and embrace his identity in me, I'll find the freedom to live out all he has planned for me. God calls me his child. He says I am wise and restored. 
that I'm a brand new creation in Christ. I am chosen and holy and blameless before God. He calls me his masterpiece. I am loved by God. He says I am made complete through the grace and mercy of Jesus, my Savior. And when I see myself the way God sees me, I walk with confidence because I trust the one who answers the question, who am I? You know, as children of God, as an apprentice of Jesus who makes apprentices of Jesus, okay, Christ should be the primary source of our identity, of who we are. You know, and as I pointed out last week, our identity determines our activity. Our identity determines our activity. What I do, who I am, right, determines what I do. Who I am determines what I do. For example, if I wake up on Sunday mornings and I put on these funny-looking pants and a nice shirt and I drive out to this, this huge area and I take out this bag full of these little sticks with these ends that are oblong and then I, I actually go out and I walk like 18 to different, 18 different holes chasing this little white ball, who am I? Right. And this is, but it goes with everything that we do. We identify with what we do, but in actuality, it should be reversed. It's what we do should come from who we are. And that's my point this morning. My point is that as children of God, we should be the most forgiving people out in this world today because we have been forgiven. forgiven. Everyone say forgiven. forgiven. How does that make you feel? Isn't that a, a wonderful feeling to be forgiven, to actually be forgiven? Not just up here in your head, but to actually be forgiven. Think of all the things that you've done wrong that you wish you were forgiven for, right? But in God's eyes, you have been forgiven. You are forgiven. And that's where we should find our identity, as forgiven children of God. But as I also mentioned, um, there are many other characteristics that Jesus manifested while here on earth that we should identify with, right? Being one, first being love, because Jesus was loving, right? There's also grace and mercy and patience and kindness and all the other gifts of the um, Spirit. But for this series, as I mentioned, there are four areas that I sense that God wants us to focus on, and they are forgiveness, family, finances, and fitness. Everyone say that with me. Forgiveness, family, finances, and fitness. Those are the four areas that we'll be exploring this month. And as I mentioned last week, forgiveness should be one of our primary characteristics of who we are and how we identify ourselves. And today, we're going to take a look at what it means to identify our family in Christ or find our identity in Christ through and in our families. And there's a, a, which reminds me of a joke about a, a, a father who's passing his son's bedroom. And he's astonished. He's astonished that the bed was made and everything was picked up and put in place. But then he sees an envelope, and, and which, you know, kind of startled him. It was propped up on his pillow. So he went and he opened the envelope and he started reading, and it, it was addressed, Dad, with a, a, a fearful premonition, he opened and continued to read the letter with trembling hands, and it read, Dear Dad, it is with great regret and sorrow that I'm writing you. You know, I had to elope with my new girlfriend because I wanted to avoid a scene with mom and you. I've been finding real passion with Stacy, and she's so nice, but I knew that you would not approve of her because of her piercings, her tattoos, her tight motorcycle clothes, and because she's so much older than I. But it's not only passion. Dad, she's pregnant. <laughs> Stacy said that she'll be 
that we will be very happy. She owns a trailer in the woods and has a stack of firewood for the whole winter. We share a dream of having many more children to add to the three that she already has. <laughs> Stacy's opened my eyes to the fact that marijuana doesn't really hurt anyone. <laughs> we'll be growing it for ourselves and trading it with the other people in the commune for all the cocaine and ecstasy we want. In the meantime, we'll pray that science will find a cure for AIDS so, so Stacy can get better. She sure deserves it. Don't worry, Dad. I'm 17, and I know how to take care of myself. Someday, I'm sure we'll be back to visit so you can get to know your many grandchildren. Love your son, Joshua. And there's a PS on the bottom, and, and it had that arrow to turn over. So he, the father turns over and says, PS, Dad, none of the above is true. I'm over at Jason's house. I just wanted to remind you that there are worse things in life than the school report card that's on the kitchen table. <laughs> Call when it's safe for me to come home. See, we should be the most forgiving people in the world, right? Especially to our family members, especially to our family members. Which brings me to my first point this morning, which is there are no perfect families. Not just there are no, you got to add that huge. Okay, let's, let's all read it together. Ready? Go. There are no perfect families. Yeah, there aren't. There really aren't any perfect families. And if you think you have a perfect family, uh, you're going to have to think again. Like, no, really, really, which reminds me of, of the mother who's in the grocery store and is just having a terrible time with her toddler. He's just running around the store, grabbing things off the shelf, and she just grabs him by the shoulders and says, will you stop it? Please, stop it. Look over there in that car. That mother has two perfectly well-behaved children. Look how good they're acting. And the toddler responded quickly and just off the cuff said, well, maybe they have good parents. <laughs> you know, and it's... <laughs> I, I have been blessed. I really have. It, being in ministry, I've been blessed to meet and get to know many healthy families. You know, some are... Uh, Good families, you would consider good. Others are even great families. You know, but in getting to know families, I've learned that there are no perfect families. There really aren't, okay? And, and, and especially in a message like this, we can easily start to look at our own families and, and start condemning ourselves and feeling guilty about what's become of our families, right? We, we look at our not-so-perfect marriages, Right? And we're like, ah. Oh. You know, we, we look at our entitled, spoiled children or grandchildren, and we're like, oh, my heart. You know, we look at our broken relationships and think to ourselves, oh, man, where is God in all of this mess? I don't know about you. That's, that's just me. That's what I do, okay? And I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm pretty normal in that. But the point isn't to feel guilty about our dysfunctional families. No, it's not. It really isn't, isn't it? No, no, no. That's, see, the gospel, the word gospel, gospel means good news. There is no guilt in f good news, right? Good news is supposed to be good. The gospel of Jesus is good. It's not about feeling condemned or guilty. No. The point, the point is to be forgiven, right? To receive forgiveness, to find our identity in Christ. And when we find our identity in Christ, especially in our families, right, our families will reflect Christ. We will reflect Christ. And that's good news. Doesn't that sound good? That sounds wonderful to me. That gives me hope. Because in actuality, that's who we really are. 
When we look in the mirror every morning, we look at, oh, and then we're like, you know, you see a full head of hair here, but it's actually not full. It's not. It's not. And, and some of you men will understand, and some women will as well. But then when I look at myself, the physical attributes that I, I see in the mirror, I'm like, oh, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's how I, I feel exactly how you, I do. I really do, which, which I... I, I I'm being sanctified because that's God's will for my life. So eventually I'll I'll hit a point where, you know, when I look in the mirror, I won't see me as I see myself, but uh, I'll see me as God sees me. And God sees me as perfect. God sees you as perfect, each and every one of you. Isn't that beautiful? That's why we're here, because we want to know more about God and feel His presence and to identify with him. There are no perfect families. Because if you really think about it, there's only one perfect father in the whole universe, and that's God the Father. And even he, the creator of the universe, had disobedient children. Started with Adam and Eve, right? In the Garden of Eden. And then from there, The Bible is full of dysfunctional family members. So that gives us hope. That's why it's important to read the Bible. When we read the Bible, hey, I feel feel the pleasure of God, but I also feel like, wow, they're messed up. If they're messed up, I have hope. It gives me hope. And that's one of the important parts of reading the Bible. See, but if we think about it, if, if... We do have a perfect God. And He's so perfect that He loves you so much that He will meet you exactly where you are. But He loves you too much to leave you there, as Pastor Wayne would constantly say. And that stuck with me. Pastor Wayne was one of my mentors at New Hope Christian Fellowship. You know, He loves you so much that He will meet you where you are. But He loves you too much to leave you there meaning that he has a future and a hope for you. You are not who you are entirely. You may think you are. When you look in the mirror, you may think that you're a complete package. But no, God has more for you. And that's the beauty of sanctification, God's will for our lives, becoming more and more like Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. See, because if if we can, because if we... If we can find our identity in Christ, you know, with all of our baggage and our insecurities and stuff that's not of Jesus, then we can teach the world to do the same, starting with our families, right? Our families should reflect Christ because that's who we belong to. We've been adopted into his family. But to be honest with you, you know, life's not easy, right? All of you guys understand that. Yeah. And loving our family takes effort. It really does. It takes a lot and a lot of effort. But when we choose, when we choose to find our identity in Christ, okay, Christ changes us. Because it's been, it's it's been a tough season for us as a family. Not, and don't get me wrong. We, I have a great family. You know, I have a beautiful wife. I have three great kids for the most part. <laughs> they're, they're hitting the, the teenage years. You know, just, just this morning, getting... My wife is a nurse. She works every other weekend. So this weekend, she, she's working. She's at the hospital now. Um, I got to get the kids up. I got to get them ready. I have to feed them. Really? I have to feed them? Yeah, you need to feed them, John, before you... Okay. You know, there's all these things that I need to do. But the most challenging part for me is, is getting my children to do things that we ask them to do. Right? Simple chores, right? Right? Everybody had chores. We all understand the importance of chores. You know? And then the other thing that's challenging is, is when they just... They're bored, and they want to just start getting on each other's nerves. And they start poke, 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 
right? How many of you have children and you know what it feels like to be poked by them? Yeah, because they know exactly where to poke. How many of you were, when you were children, knew exactly which buttons to push for your parents? Right? Yeah, it's, just, it's because we inherit that challenging part about us. Okay? Like just this morning, I, I get them here, you know, and then um, I'm running a little late. I have to set up the audio visual part. I run back because I forget something, and they're already in there poking at each other. Yeah. And then, you know, my default system, I grew up in a family dysfunction. Well, I, I look at it like this. God has brought us, and his grace has brought us to this point, and it's, it's been a beautiful journey. It has. It's, but it's been a journey, and the journey's been up and down. You know, immigrant family, my dad worked seven days a week, never saw him pretty much had to raise myself. So because of that, you know, I, I learned a lot of the values from friends and from TV and movies and just culture and, you know, and a lot of the things that I learned weren't good. So I, I have to relearn things. And as I relearn things, it, it can be challenging. It can be painful. So I want to teach my children to find their identity in Christ. But what do, what do children do? What do we do as children? We, no, we, we uh, inherit our parents' traits, right? I am my dad. I am my mom, or well, part of. And, and you are your parents, and you are your grandparents, or your, the influence. Of, but I want my children to find their identity in Christ. So in order to do that, you know, I have to be, I have to parent. Oh, shucks. And it can be challenging, right? How many of you know it's challenging parenting and being parents? Or when you were children, how, how many of you gave your parents? Yeah, we all relate to that. So we need to speak their language. And my kid's language is cell phone. <laughs> it is. That's their currency. Guess what? Oh, shucks. You didn't do your chores today. Give me your cell phone. What? It's, it's, well, actually, it's not your cell phone because I paid for it. I actually have the visa bill that shows that I paid for it. I pay the monthly. It's, it's not your cell phone. It's, it's my cell phone, but I'm letting you borrow it because I'm being gracious like our Heavenly Father is gracious. See, see how I, <laughs> see how I, no, but, but really, that's what it means to find our identity in Christ. But it, we really need to understand that because really we have been all adopted into God's family as John read for us from the Ephesians passage. And, and John, sorry about that, uh, Corinth, not Corinthians, the uh, Chronicles passage because I'm not going to touch on that today. At first I was going to, but I'm not going to. See, as the passage in Ephesians tells us, in fact, let, let's read it together. It's up on the screen for you. Ready? Go. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. That's God's will for our lives. And uh, excuse me, I should have... Um, it's sonship and daughtership, if that's even a word. But we have been adopted both as sons and daughters into the family of God. And God predestined this. He already knew this beforehand. But what does that mean? Well, practically, that's the good news. We've been adopted into the family of God. And again, His will for us is to be holy to be blameless, to be like Jesus. But it's through the power of the Holy Spirit who works in us as he's transforming us. How does God transform us? You know, I haven't touched much upon, upon the Transformation Act, and, and we're going to start moving into a season where we're going to start talking about it and living it. The transformation comes through obedience. <gasps> Isn't that a novel thought? And when we obey the little things that God asks us to because he's going to meet us where we're at. 
right? When we, God meets us where we're at, our present um, spot, he gives us insights. He gives us little promptings, and he'll send challenges our, our way as well. And in those challenging opportunities, the Bible says, woohoo, we get to rejoice. Rejoice always, friends, brothers and sisters in Christ. But think about it this way. Even without Christ, you're going to be challenged. You are. So you might as well have the power of God with you in the challenges, right? Doesn't that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, everybody's challenged. It looks good on the outside. Everybody posts the most fabulous meals, the dinners, lunches. Everybody posts the pictures of the beautiful sunset. Everybody posts the pictures. Of, but it's all a facade. It is. It really is. Everybody has challenges. We all have challenges. And it's okay, especially for us because we've been adopted into the family of God. Amen. Woohoo! That's a good thing. See, that's what it practically means. In, in my dysfunctional family, I get to learn what it means to be part of God's family. And as I learn to be a part of God's family, it slowly transforms my family. And then our family gets to go out into the world and be a light because how many of you know someone who's hurting? Yeah. Yeah, especially in our world today. And I'm not talking about just looking on the streets and, and just looking at the disarray of what society's become. It's just... No, I'm talking about, I know people, and they're having a challenging time navigating this path of life. But then I get people ask all the time, hey, you know, how do you have such a great relationship with your kids or with your wife? And, and then I joke, you know, it's a lot of work, but it is. It is. It's, it doesn't come easy. My wife and I still have intense fellowship all the time. Because it's good for me. It, God uses her to sanctify me. God speaks to me th through her. I don't like it. I don't. You ask my wife. She'll tell you. Every time we've had challenges, it's normally because she says, you know, what about... She normally doesn't say it nicely like that, but I'm just showing you because my <laughs> wife is nice. What about this? And for some whatever reason within me is irked and it's like... I get all defensive or I get all, but in actuality, and this is because my wife is godly, she's persistent and she, she, she keeps at it. It's because my currency is, is, you know, love and I like being loved by my wife. So it, she doesn't withhold it, but she gives me that. And in that love, I, I'm changed. Oh, wow. So I've learned something. I've learned something new. And I try to do that with our kids. But it's, it's that persistence. It's that key, you know? It, we got to be persistent and consistent. You know, and I look into our congregation, and, you know, we have an older congregation, but we do have younger families here with children. And I'm speaking to you parents, but then I'm also speaking to you grandparents and uncles and aunties. You know, Statistics show, the statistics are endless, that, that our children want your input. You know, research from Emory University has identified the importance of the family narrative, the family story, the kids knowing who they are, where they come from. And it's vital for them. And what I'm saying this morning is it, it needs to start with Christ. You know, but it's like, oh, I'm, you know, I've grown up in the church all these years and I've never read the Bible or I've never done this. Or I'm... God meets us where we're at, but he loves us too much to leave us there. Oh, but you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You're not a dog. You're not. You're not. You guys, you guys are children of God. 
you are incredible. Brain research shows that you, there is still activity, brain activity, regardless of what age you are. You can learn new things. Oh, I can never memorize scripture. I bet you, you can. If I speak your currency, whatever that currency is, I bet you, you can. For me, it's Diet Coke. You know, you threaten my Diet Coke, I'll, do, I'll jump through hoops. For now, David and I have this inside joke about my Diet Coke and stuff. But then eventually, pretty soon, as, uh, when we complete renovation of our, our home, that's no longer going to be currency for me. I'm going to, that's, see, each of us have something that speaks to us. And what I'm saying is, it all starts because we've been adopted into the family of God. And it's a beautiful thing. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's close in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for being such a gracious and merciful and loving father. One who has pardoned us of our sins through your son, Jesus the Christ, as we identify with him and as we identify with your family. Thank you for adopting us into your family. But many of us may feel kind of awkward because it's just not normal. We don't know how we fit into your family and how we're supposed to act and what we're supposed to do and how we treat each other and how we even relate with you. But in actuality, God, we can trust in you and we can trust that you will guide us because you are such a good father. So we ask you to do that at this time. All right. Confirm in our hearts your presence through your Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for confirming that you are here and that you live in us, that you've welcomed us into your glory. We thank you for the opportunity to partner with you to make a difference in this world, starting with prayer. We thank you that even before we ask, you know. Yeah. That's so assuring, Lord, that even before we ask for what we need or what we want or how we need your guidance, you know, and you are here with us. So, Lord, we do take up that mantle, and we do pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, for our family members who don't know you, for those who need healing, physical healing, spiritual healing, healing within their souls. We pray for Reverend Randy and for Evelyn and for Sherry and Dave and Ben and Richard, for Christian over at Tripler Hospital, Lord, for Mildred and Paul and Anne, for Katie, for Charlene, for Travis, for Harvey, Clara, Barbara, Mark, Ray, Kiku, Barbara, Betty, Kimmy. Pray for Dr. Les, for Toshio, Eleanor, Ellen, Henry, for me and Gary, Dixie, Elmer, for Lorraine, Kyoko, Teruo, Harry, Betty, Ethel, Annie, Takumi, Sam, Trudy, Estelle, Merv, Peter, Margaret, for Alice, Paul, Dorothy. Go ahead, brothers and sisters, lift up your friends, your family members. Lift them up. Partner with God. Increase your faith. Ask God to do a miracle because he's in in the business of doing miracles. Ask and believe. Don't doubt. Lord, increase our faith. 
Is anyone in here need any type of healing? In whatever way, physical healing, spiritual healing, emotional healing. Yeah? If you do, just, just raise a hand. Yeah? Yep, I see your hands. I see your hands. I see your hands. Yeah? God sees your hands too. And I say, in Jesus' name, be healed. With the authority that Jesus has given to us, be healed, whatever it may be. Whatever it may be. Because we are healed in Christ. Amen? We are, we are, AR. Praise the Lord.